Well, it's good to be back. For those that maybe don't know, uh, I had the unique and distinct privilege uh, to join my parents for their 50th wedding anniversary trip, uh, which they decided for their 50th wedding anniversary, they would grant us a trip to the Caribbean uh, with them. Uh, And that was quite gracious and generous of them. And we had a fantastic time. Uh, We got to see and do lots of things, got to swim with some dolphins, uh, got to got to swim with some turtles, got to eat some good food, and got to spend precious time with family. I wrote a little bit about that in the newsletter this week um, and kind of what thoughts I had. But as I got ready to preach, I thought, well, you know, I could talk about what I talked about in my letter, which was covenant, and talking about how Easter is the fulfillment of God's covenant of love with us and what it, how it looks like marriage. I thought, nah, I wrote about that already. Maybe I'll take another angle. And as I was thinking about what to share with you for this Easter, God told me distinctly in my spirit to share with you resurrection power. Now, I know that for a lot of us, I grew up Southern Baptist. Anybody else? If you grew up Southern Baptist, just give me a whoop. Yeah, thanks. And if you grew up Southern Baptist, we focus an awful lot on the blood of Jesus Christ, okay? We talk about, we got in, in, in Baptist terms, we got the blood songs, right? Like we sing the hymns that talk about Jesus' blood and we emphasize that it's the blood of Jesus that washes away our sin. And these things are true, but something struck me as I got ready to preach for Easter this, this morning. And it was that it's, it is the blood of Christ that is the sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. We, we affirm that every time we have communion. We give the bread and we say the body of Christ given for you. And then you come to the juice and we say the blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Jesus mattered. It, it, was a, it was a part of the story. It was a very important part of the story. Jesus had to die. There had to be a sacrifice. And that's, that's a little bit of a hot take. Not everybody in Christianity totally agrees with that. And it makes us uncomfortable. It's like, oh, did he have to? I mean, why would God the Father let Jesus the Son die? Go through that. That seems mean, right? What kind of father lets their son go through that? But the truth is sin required a payment that Jesus was willing to pay, that he volunteered to do. It wasn't like he was forced to do it. And so the blood he sheds on the cross does matter. But church, I've come to think this morning that maybe the resurrection matters more. Because if it's just the blood of Jesus, if he just dies, then it means nothing. There have been countless numbers of men and women who have died throughout history for causes, for beliefs, for thoughts they had about being right. Not one that I know of came back to life. Not one. The resurrection is the power of God's message to you today. Without it, it has no meaning. The Gospel of John, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, who was in our show the other night. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings there. Sorry. And he went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. 
But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them with his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may, know, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. What was written about the resurrection? Why was it written? So that you may come to believe what? That Jesus is who he said he was, and that God is what he said he is, and that the promises he made are kept. This is important. Because if Jesus is a man who walked the earth and taught good things, which many religions and many irreligious people believe and say, Jesus, what a great teacher. What great, what great morality what great insight, what great wisdom, a teacher worth listening to, a teacher worth reading, a teacher worth paying some attention to. If Jesus was just a teacher, then he's no different than whoever taught you third grade science or history in fifth grade. And teachers are great, don't get me wrong. And science is great and history is great. But a teacher adds knowledge and that's pretty much it. Jesus said, I'm the Messiah. To be the Messiah, Jesus had to be resurrected. And because he is resurrected, we are told this is what is being given to us as the proof we need to understand that God is real and that Jesus is the Messiah and not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, not just a prophet. It validates Jesus. The resurrection matters because it validates Jesus was who he said he was. No resurrection means there's no truth in Jesus's message at all because who among us believes a liar once we know them to have lied to us? It's hard. You might do it if it's someone close to you. 
But if it's someone you don't know, once trust is broken, it is hard to reestablish trust. If we come to find out that Jesus said he's the son of God, that he has power over sin and death, and then he dies and he stays in the tomb, he's not who he said he was, and he lied. And if he lied about that, what else did he lie about? And why do I believe any of it anyway? Why would I call him good? Why would I call him a prophet? Why would I call him an excellent teacher? Because if he's not God, then he'd still be in the tomb. But because of the resurrection, we see that he is who he said he was. He is the deity he claimed to be. He did fulfill the Old Testament prophecy he promised he would fulfill. He's trustworthy and he's true. The second thing we see here why the resurrection matters is because Jesus claimed to be the resurrection and the the life. Jesus is life. If we have any hope at all in the claim we make that we will live again with the Father, it's because Jesus rose from the, the dead. It's because God demonstrated his power over sin and death. It's because Jesus went first. And because Jesus went first, we get to go also. Jesus himself told us, I am going to let you do greater things than me. Well, Jesus rose from the dead. That's exciting. I can do greater things? Yes. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of God's actions towards you. It is the proof that you may have life, as John just told us, that you may have life in his name. In what name? The name of a man who was a good teacher and stayed dead? Absolutely not. It could only be in the name of the Son of God who rose again. And if it's true, then that is the name that brings life. That is the promise that we hold on to. That if we believe in Christ, like the Scriptures say, then we will not perish, but have eternal life. And that's a good word, church. Because this life sometimes is a two-week cruise in the Caribbean. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's full of horrible things, unspeakable things, things that drive us to our very breaking point and sometimes beyond I need it to be true that there's something more than this. Amen? I need that to be true. And if Jesus didn't come out of the tomb, then there's no hope that it is. If the very Son of God who claimed to be the Son of God died and stayed dead and God didn't raise him, what chance do I have? Praise God. He did. And he not only raised Christ, but promised to raise us as well that believe in his son. It proves who Jesus is. It proves that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. It shows that God has power over sin and death. And that we will not stay dead. Now here's the really good news. That's pretty good news. Getting to live forever is good news, right? No? Okay, careful what you tell Jesus today. Getting to stay alive forever is good news, right? Yes. But what about today? What about right now? Pastor, there are some things in my life that are pretty dead. There are some things in my life that have no hope. There are some things in my life that I don't see a way out of. There are some things in my life that if Jesus is really God and he's really good and he's really alive, I don't understand why I'm going through them. Pastor, today's not what I think Easter is in my own life. I mean, I put on some nice clothes and I came to church and I'm pretending to have it together, but it's really coming apart for me, Pastor, and I don't feel Easter now. To you, my brother or sister, know that the resurrection power that God has for you is not really about living forever. It's about living now. If 
Ephesians 1, 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power, the same power, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. For above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. This is what Ephesians just said. The same power that God raised Christ with, he puts in you. You know what that means right now in this room that nothing is truly dead. Not one thing, church. Nothing. You're looking at with hopeless eyes, with eyes of longing and saying, I wish that could come back. I wish that wasn't gone is truly dead because of the resurrection. Watch this. Your relationship with your kids isn't dead. Yeah, you said what you said. No, you can't take it back. But because Jesus Christ is alive, there is hope for your relationship with your children. It's never truly dead. God can renew anything and everything. Your marriage, it's not dead. You might be thinking, yeah, I mean, we're together and it's going okay, but it's not what it was. It's not what I hoped for. It's not where I thought it was going to go. It's certainly not the picture I thought it might be that would show others the way to Christ because our marriage was such a beautiful picture and it would lead others to see Jesus because of that same picture that is in the scriptures about marriage. It feels dead, Pastor. Great news today, friend. Your marriage isn't dead. If Jesus can come out of the tomb, your marriage can come back to life. Amen? Your career is not dead. Well, maybe if you're like retired, you're like, yeah, it is. I'm done. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> but for those of us who are still chasing what that work life looks like, and we've not exactly landed exactly where we want to be, and things aren't going exactly how we want them to go, and we've sort of surrendered the idea that it'll ever get anywhere we want it to go, it's not dead, friend. Your career's not dead. God's not done with your work as a representation of him on earth. And by the way, if you're retired, your life's purpose isn't dead. I mean, just because you're retired doesn't mean you stop mattering. Somebody who's retired, say amen. amen. If you're busier in retirement than you were when you were working, say amen. amen. Yeah, I know. I've heard that. I look forward to trying it someday. But even in that space, you might be like, yep, I had a successful career. I retired. The money's straight, but I don't feel like I matter in this world. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what God could use me for anyway. Good news, friend. Your purpose isn't dead. You might be on the other end of that spectrum. You might be like in first, second, third, fifth, freshman, college. I got no idea what my life's purpose is. It's not dead. Ask of the Lord, and he will answer you. He will show you your life's purpose. But it is never, ever too late. I cannot tell you how many times in college I was like, well, that's it. I have totally have goofed it. That's the last one. I'll tell you an especially poignant moment when I, I thought it really was over. I had kind of goofed on grades, kind of as a soft word. And in order to keep some scholarships I had to have to stay at this school that I still wasn't paying for all of, but if, as long as I had a little bit to cover it, I was like not, you know, going to be in debt till well, yesterday. But anyways, I had to write a letter to the, to the president of the university. And it, it was basically like a please let me stay letter, a begging to stay letter. I remember sitting in my apartment writing this letter and thinking there's no reason, he has no reason to say yes to this. I've demonstrated no good faith at this point. I know I, I could get things together. I, I believe I can. I really think I could get my life pointed in the right direction. But he doesn't know me. We've never spoke. And I'm going to put wor words on a, a, a page that somehow magically convince him. I, to this day, don't remember what I wrote. 
I have no idea. It was probably some really bad mumbo jumbo, honestly. But for some reason, he granted me a second chance. I thought it was dead. I thought my, I was like, well, everything I thought I was going to do is over. I can't, I can't even stay in school. Not that college is the end all be all. Listen to me, students. It's not. You might find yourself on a different path, and that's good. But the one I was on, I thought I needed a degree for, and I thought I couldn't get that degree, and I thought, well, then that dream is dead. That, that path, my purpose is dead. No. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're never down and out. You're always just one yes to God away from a comeback. Mine was that, that university president, sight unseen, was like, sure, why not? Your character is not dead. Yeah, you might have messed up pretty bad. But don't tell that to the thousands of prison ministers who go into jails every day and assure those inmates that you have not done anything so egregious that God can't forgive you. Are they lying to them? No. You know why? Because the resurrection has power. That even the, the murderer on death row can find redemption and new life and forgiveness of sin if they'll repent. And so the person who goes in and tells them, yeah, you murdered, but your character isn't dead forever. It can be redeemed. God can forgive you. It's true. And if God can do that for someone in that situation, he can do it for you too. Yes, you yelled. Yes, you lied. Yes, you cheated your business partner. But if you'll repent and ask for forgiveness, God can resurrect your character also. It's not dead. And that's good news. Your identity as worthy isn't dead. A lot of times we just think to ourselves, well, I mean, I'm, I get what he's saying, but am I really worthy of all this? Yes. Well, because I did something great? No. Because God decided that you're worthy. Because God sees your worth in your createdness, which he gave you. And so he says, because I made you, you're worthy. So who is that? Who did God make? You. And how many other people? Everybody. So is anybody's life at a, dis at a stop where God can't redeem it? No. Your identity isn't dead. Your dreams aren't dead. God gave you those dreams for a reason. Maybe you quit on them a long time ago. They're not dead. They can be resurrected. Maybe you think your finances are dead. A little Dave Ramsey and a little hard work, and they can be alive again. Many of us think unity is dead, that division is the rule of the day. Church, I tell you this, it's not dead. The unity that Christ specifically said, I hope the above all things that what you have when I'm gone is unity. Do you know Jesus said that? That's, that dream's not dead. It's looking bleak at the moment. <laughs> it's it's going to be a tough one, right? But it's not dead. Because of the power of the resurrection, even unity itself can come back. Confidence in yourself and in the world around you is not dead. A lot of us are becoming despondent as we look out into the world and saying, I don't, I don't see how any of this is going to ever get any better. I don't see how I'm going to ever get any better. My confidence is low. My, my, my confidence in my fellow human is getting lower. Don't let that die. Don't let your, your confidence in yourself and in, and in people who are good and who believe in the name of Jesus die. But allow it to be resurrected because Christ came out of that grave. Church, this means that nothing is truly dead. We tell ourselves, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. I believe the enemy twists those words and whispers them into your ear in a way that's not meant to be. When Jesus said it is finished, what he meant was all the work needed to accomplish what's about to come next is finished. My, my to-do list is done. My task list is over. I've taught all the things. I've prepped all the people. I've paid the price. Everything that had to happen is finished. That was an affirming comment. It is done. 
Everything is completed. Now what happens next is up to God. And what happened next? Resurrection. But here's what the enemy does. The enemy whispers in your ear the same phrase, to, to kill you. It's finished. Your relationship is finished. Your marriage is done. Your career is done. Your purpose is finished. The enemy whispers, it is finished. But the resurrection is the opposite message, that Christ brings resurrection. Everything and anything can be made new. These were Jesus' words himself as he carried the cross. He looked at his mother and he said, Behold, woman. I'm not sure why he did that to his mom sometimes. Called her woman. Had to get on her nerve. (laughs) He did it with the wine thing too. Behold, woman, I make all things new. So whatever you drug in here today that's dead, that you think is dead. It's not. The power of Christ means that nothing is ever truly dead, that all things can be made new, that you are not as far gone as you think you are, but that you can come back to life, not just the really miraculous kind where when we die, we come back to life and live with Christ, which is awesome and hard to even fathom. But God isn't like, hey, live this life however it shakes out, and I'll see you on the other side. God says, no, right now. Right now is resurrection power for you. Whatever you think is dead can come to life right now. I hope... I pray that that's a good word for you today. It should be the best word. I can't imagine a better word than there is nothing in your life that's so far gone, Jesus can't resurrect it and bring it back to life. We read in one of the cards this morning, someone prayed for a family member who's struggling with addiction, even addiction, church. Even an addiction that's hounded you for decades that you've had some victory over and slipped back in and out of and you think you know what I just I just can't I'm just gonna have to be okay with this no you don't Jesus intends for you to have life not to lose to those things that we think are are winning but to win to have victory to have power to have resurrection power over sin, the things causing those dead places, and death. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for the power of the resurrection. That it's not just the blood that was shed on the cross, but it's the act of coming back to life that shows us that Jesus is who he said he is. And if that's true, then he can be trusted. God, your word tells us that the same power that brought Jesus back to life lives in us. That means that we have resurrection power in us every day. And so anything in our life that is dead can be brought back. So God, this morning as we sing our closing, I pray that we would lift up any dead places in our life this morning and just simply ask you to make it alive again where where is that place in us lord did we just assume our our life's purpose is over have we given up on dreams have we settled for damaged relationships lord you make all things new so holy spirit come And make us alive, not somewhere in the future, but right now. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.